So now let's go further into this wisdom, if that's the right word for prajna, development through centrism. Wisdom, I'm afraid, in our English connotations of the term, kind of indicates the elder person's resignation to reality as we sort of as it seems to be, and a kind of giving up of thinking, youthful thought that we're going to break through and change reality and make it something better and something like that. So wisdom tends to have that idea, whereas the word prajna in Sanskrit, jnya, as I've said before, just about to mention again, nya means to know, pra means super or intensely. So it's a deep penetrating knowledge of something, not just a resignation to it. And the symbol of the wisdom is not the old gray beard, but is the young, uh, 16-year-old Manjushri, sort of archangel, holding the sword of critical wisdom, of critical insight, and holding up the book of transcendent wisdom, uh, transcendent prajna, you know, genius, you might call it even, rather than wisdom. You know, if you think of extreme intelligence as genius, then genius is probably, transcendent genius is probably a better term for prajna paramita. So, anyway, its main focus is to develop critical awareness of apparent realities using both analytic and concentrative types of contemplative skills to explore self and world with a view to distinguishing the real from the unreal, both intellectually and whatever you distinguish intellectually, you come to distinguish experientially through the concentrating contemplative type of thing. 1700 years before Kant in the West, Nagarjuna composed 27 critiques of all the main categories and concepts by which apparent reality is organized, revealing their subjectivity and conceptually constructed nature, and guiding subsequent generations of analytic seekers' thought experiments that put to the test and deconstruct the following controlling concepts of things, productions, causation, motion, nature, reality, the self, physical and mental objects, relation, substance, quality, time, space, causation, matter, mind, samsara, and nirvana. Whatever people think is their concept matches, or and even nothingness, actually. Well, they, they have a concept of it, so therefore there is something there. He deconstructs that there is something, that these concepts uh, are just bouncing off some essence in the things, and he makes the Copernican revolution that Kant was so proud of, realizing that the concepts itself creates the thing, in a sense, because the thing in itself can never be reached by the human cognition, in Kant's view. Kant, of course, and Nagarjuna took a slightly different view of what that implies, and, what, and the sort of experiential or existential uh, meaning of that fact. But, but both came up with that insight, but Nagarjuna 1,700 years earlier. To give an example, taking the self, the experimenter develops a high degree of rigorous reasoning power and also supernormal meditative concentrational ability. She or he then turns attention inward to examine the body and mind to discover and assess the inwardly felt sense of self or identity. An important step here is to drill down within until she or he discovers a sense of substantial presence within one's own self, as, a, as if it were a massive fact, an undeniable, seemingly self-subsistent entity. And here, for example, I like to give the thought experiment of when you look at a photo of yourself five or ten years ago, and you see yourself at a picnic or at the beach or in some sort of a situation, and you seem like a quite different body than you are now five or ten years later. You look very different to yourself. But when you kind of get into remembering yourself in that moment, if you can, it's suddenly when you feel, ah, yes, this one element of me is, was just there, the same exact me without having changed. And so we all have that kind of feeling that that is the root and anchor of our, of our continuity, something unchanging in the midst of all the changing things. And we always we will find that when we look and go down memory lane in the family scrapbook and look at a picture. But actually, we know scientifically there's not one atom or subatomic particle in us that is the same as it was five or ten years ago. Any scientist will assure us of that. There's no one thing that has been absolutely unchanged. Maybe the name 
if you if you think the name Bob is still Bob, although maybe five or ten years ago you had a different nickname, you never know. But the point is, otherwise there's nothing that's unchanged about it. And therefore there's this kind of illusion in the self, that's a sort of very superficial way of finding in, your, in ourself the, the automatic feeling that we are programmed to have by our culture, by even our, our genetic background, according to Buddhists, our own individual genetic background, as well as our parental one through the culture. But this, this sense of, a, of an unchanging thing making a continuity of change possible, whereas the unchanging thing cannot connect to the continuity of change, obviously, logically and scientifically, or it would change. When you connect to a changing thing, the thing that connects changes. There's no way an unchanging thing could stay unchanged and connect to the changing thing. That we can obviously see logically. But to see that experiment, experimentally and experientially through this concentrated awareness is a liberation from holding a kind of false center and a core essential feeling about oneself. And that's what's involved here. Having acknowledged that to oneself, one remembers that the Buddha and his followers' traditions argue that there is no such thing as that unchanging core. And the sense of its static presence within is illusory. And the, and the strain of holding it within is a cause of suffering, even. This argument is accepted as a challenge. It, they, you know, it, it doesn't help to just believe this argument, because it's not that easy to get out of one's instinctual makeup. The argument is accepted properly as a challenge to how one actually feels instinctively, and one accepts that challenge and drills down within oneself more deeply to discover what is actually in the core of me. And when one doesn't find what one thought was there, an unchanging fixed identity, this then gives one a more resilient you know, way of being, interacting with all the changing things, and reduces the suffering of engaging with those changing things, in fact, according to Buddhist scientific, psychological, analytic insight and discovery. The thought experiment keeps dissecting apparent static things down to atoms and subatomic particles, as well as seemingly apparent moments of time. This analytic investigation, when empowered by a very stabilized concentration, leads to an experience of conclusively not finding the seemingly solid inner presence of the self. And there is a threshold experience of even a frightening, can be, a seeming nothingness. And finally, a release into a sense of the reality of space, into which everything seemingly solid has been dissolved. This type of transcendentalist experience occurs through the threshold of nothingness to where one is just a vast, feels one is what one identity is in a way is just vast space, which in a way is very impersonal sort of thing. The investigator does not just postulate that as a foregone conclusion. She or he resists it, in fact, to the utmost and only eventually loses the identity sense and floats free. This is a sensitive moment in the research, as the static, the state, the state can easily be confused with an annihilative nothingness, as we described in the last module. If the investigator is well prepared, however, philosophically, the way scientists should be, no self-respecting scientist should be just sitting there dropping things in and out of test tubes. That any assistant can do that. The scientist must be trained philosophically to be analytically self-aware of how they formulate things and create formulas and how they use even special scientific languages and symbolisms and mathematics. They need to be philosophically trained and not philosophically naive to be decent scientists. However, she or he is not trapped there and to just a philosophy but witnesses a dissolving of the spatial experience itself. So you don't get trapped, or this is very important, you don't get trapped in a floating free experience where you think, oh, now everything seems like empty space to me. So now that must be emptiness. I now discovered the one solid thing there is, which is sort of the absolute, which is emptiness. A lot of Buddhists make this mistake. But when you bear down, you continue, you develop such a powerful, critical, blazing, flaming sword type of intelligence, of genius intelligence. Do you, although you hit the space when you're looking for the solid non-spatial thing like the core identity, 
you, that same critical thing goes into the space, and what is it? And then the space disappears. So in other words, the, dis the disappeared state disappears. And then the world of relational objects, subjects, and relativities returns. Though now its, substantial, its substantiality seems less secure, more illusory, said to be dreamlike or illusion-like. It's not that it now seems to be totally unreal or it's all woo-woo type of thing. It looks just like it did, maybe even, especially to the beginning investigator. But now once they've seen it disappear, when they really bore down analytically, they, they realize its seeming solidity now is illusory, so they simultaneously see it that way. The investigator goes back and forth. And, and we, if we say, oh, that's impossible that they can see like that, but no, they can, because, and here the analogy of a mirror is very important to just mention. When you first see your reflection in a mirror, although we co almost cannot remember such a first moment, but when we did, or when a baby does, or a dog does, they think that through it, there's another room in there, and they want to reach through the window. They reach into that room, and they bang onto the surface of the mirror. Then once we know that, when we see it, although it still looks like that, we know it's just a reflection, two-dimensional reflection of a three-dimensional space behind us, and it's just reflected on the surface of a mirror. So when you go through this back and forth, uh, you, you know when you see things seemingly, again, to be solid as if they were things in themselves, and to use the Kantian term, you know automatically there is no thing in itself and it will dissolve under analysis if you really bear down atom by atom into it. It will dissolve and uh, therefore you realize it's illusory nature at the same time as you see it as if it were solid. The investigator goes back and forth subsequently between the space-like state and the dream-like aftermath state until the two become experienced as a unity, which takes quite a while and is a quite a high attainment. That's the attainment of non-duality. I call this kind of sought enlightenment as something like an ultimate tolerance of cognitive dissonance, just like the tolerance we have when we look at a mirror and we do something on the right side of our face by touching what looks like the left side in the mirror. That's because we have a tolerance of the cognitive dissonance that this is only a mirror reflection and left, right are reversed. Uh, so this is, illustrates the type of inner science investigation, experience, and experiment that the Buddhist inner science did within that curriculum in the cultivation of genius intelligence, which we call wisdom by custom and convention nowadays in, uh, in our translations of that term prajna, although I'm not sure we shouldn't change that to genius transcendence. But anyway, you know, it's Einstein-level stuff.